said I'm a crush it. Unfortunately, it's not the exception. Uh, maybe a little bit more of the rule that old surviving cinemas have been cut up. Um, the Dennis Theater uh, in Mount Lebanon, originally a single screen, uh, was cut up into three theaters um, with the idea that you can maximize you know, ticket sales, you can show um, three different films at the same time. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, a lot of movie theaters were cut up. Um, and that's one thing that you know, makes the Hollywood theater um, kind of unique is that it was never cut up. Um, yeah, so uh, you know, in a lot of cases, single screens, they would actually uh, make the balcony a second screen. And the screen itself would actually go right where you see the lip of uh, the balcony is. So you'd actually be sitting, you know, in a in a chair right there, and literally eight, you know, six to eight feet away from you would be a screen. And looking up at that, they still exist. I mean, uh, there's a, I know there's a, uh, a tiny town in Michigan that I've been to, uh, West Branch, that has exactly that. You see a movie, you know, in the balcony, and the screen's like all there, and you're sitting like this, uh, and it's just uh, not a not a classic movie experience. Um, so, you know, I, I was trying to think of open historic cinemas in, uh, or just open cinemas in, Pittsburgh, in the Pittsburgh area that still have a balcony. I'm trying to think of, I think the Harris, it does, Harris. and maybe the, the Regent Square. If the Regent has one, I haven't been up in it. I don't think it does. Okay. Um, so uh, something, again, something, that you can experience here that, um, that you might, well, you won't experience it at uh, the, the, you know, your, your local multiplex. Um, you know, we've had a lot of fans of the Hollywood mention their romances were kindled <laughs> in the balcony. Um, and uh, actually, I was speaking with somebody yesterday. There's also uh, historically this question of um, the racial makeup of patrons of cinemas. Um, I don't know Dormont's um, demographics from the earlier part of uh, the 20th century or the mid part. Um, I think it was primary Caucasian, um, but historically there were there was um, segregation that would happen between the main floor and the balcony. I don't think that that was the case with Hollywood, um, but it was just sort of an interesting um, note, something to think about that that um, that was an unfortunate consequence of, uh, of balconies uh, with some cinemas across the the world. Uh, so is the balcony in high demand nowadays? Yeah, you know, people are always interested in coming up to the balcony. Um, and uh, of course we have, well, these are our primary seats right here uh, for the balcony. Um, and then we also have, when the theater was reopened in 2007, um, they had installed uh, um, couches and, and chairs like this in both sections. Uh, and we also have them in the back sections of the uh, main floor theater. And so, uh, you know, kids always love these in particular. Like I wouldn't want to sit back in there because it's such a long way from the, um, from the screen. I love sitting in the balcony. I'd probably sit up here. Um, but kids, of course, always feel like they're, um, you know, they're, <laughs> they're getting away from it uh, back up in here. Um, I thought I would also mention, uh, I don't know, I suspect that this was just general seating. Um, historically speaking, 2006 when they renovated the theater, I was told that the idea, and I, maybe I'm wrong, but I was told that um, the idea for this space was for a cry room. Um, if, you're, if you have a baby and your baby starts to cry during the film, there's a, there basically was a soundproof booth. Um, some older cinemas have those. So maybe that was what this space was for. I'm not sure why they, otherwise I'm not sure why they would have um, roped it off like this, maybe for the seating capacity issue. Um, but what this means for me uh, and for the theater is that I really like this space for uh, in addition of a sound and light board here to support um, live events and concerts in the future. So, you know, we have several tiers of fundraising we need to do as a nonprofit. Um, you know, the first is getting that digital projector. The second is improving lighting and sound in the theater, and that will include running sound down to the stage. Uh, currently, 
you know, I think there's two um, uh, non-grounded um, outlets on the front of the theater. Uh, I mean, on the front of the stage, we need to convert those. We need to have sound wired down there. You know, we have a wireless mic that we can use, but uh, if we want to do more live events, we need to, um, to be able to support sound. Uh, yeah, and then do a sound on the light board here. So that's the second stage of fundraising, make those improvements so we can support more live events at the Hollywood. Um, let's see, uh, third stage would just be some other improvements to the theater and then our ultimate goal is to purchase the building. Um, uh, a longevity issue we want um, to make sure that, uh, that the Hollywood stays open and stays open as uh, a nonprofit cinema, that's our, our goal. So. so why is it important I don't think we've talked to, you know, because actually you're a film historian. Um, why is it important to preserve theaters like this well, in a community? I think, um, I think it's tied to the history of the community. And so, um, you know, I, th I think that it doesn't generate the same, um, the, th the same, Interest, excitement, enthusiasm, and enthusiasm from uh, from community members to go into a you know a, a, just a box of a theater that's meant for you to sit down, you watch a movie. It's not for it's not for engaging your neighbors. It's not for um, discussing the films. It's not for you know seeing a um, you know seeing a, a comedy troupe heckle a movie live or you know whatever the event might be. The formula is quite different for a big box, uh, you know, um, a theater chain, versus a smaller cinema like this. It's more about it's tied to the neighborhood. It's um, you know, there's a history of of generations of doormoners who have come to this theater, uh, and you know, I was actually we're um, currently developing a, a tribute event uh, for hopefully later this summer. To uh, there was a doormoner. Um, and country music legend named Slim Bryant. And um, he was, a, uh, I think he was a member of the Grand Ole Opry. He recorded, was one of the last surviving um, uh, people to have recorded with Jimmy Rogers, the, basically the founder of country music. Um, and uh, he passed away just a, a few years ago. He owned a flower shop, or excuse me, a card shop uh, around the corner and taught guitar lessons uh, in the basement. Um, and you know, I'm just starting to find out more about him. Well, I um, got in touch with his son, uh, who's going to help us organize the event. And you know, he talks about his father coming here in the '50s, and then bringing you know him here in the '60s. Um, they literally came here, you know, a thousand times uh, to see movies, and just like they would, you know, talk about how important this movie theater was to them in the community. So the more I talk to people in the community and find out. Um, you know, just how many people have, have come here and are so um, glad that it's still here and still open and that it means something to them and that they're able to bring their children here. I think, um, I don't think you'd get that, you wouldn't get that with, you know, um, uh, you know, the big lows. You don't have those <laughs> types of stories or memories about going there. Um, they just don't, you know, those big box theaters just don't last and, uh, uh, you know, we, you know, we've been around for, I don't know, 90, 90 plus years, and um, I suspect a lot of the, the bigger chains will, will not be able to say the same um, as technologies change. Um, you know, a lot of them have closed um, and become churches or uh, are demolished um, just because they don't have uh, those intrinsic historical uh, and community ties. So uh, I mentioned before, we're, we've started up a lot of different series. And so I mentioned before, we're trying to find our niche in, in Pittsburgh and in film uh, in Pittsburgh. I think as, you know, in order for us to survive, we need to be unique in our programming. And our, um, our programming needs to be event-oriented in order to, um, to interest people into coming rather than sitting uh, at, you know, at home and hitting you know, uh, putting in their code to order the latest um, movie. Uh, entirely different experience. But so we're, you know, uh, when we can, we try to t tie in live music. We started up this, seri um, this series, uh, uh, Apple Shop Film Series. They're 
a documentary arts organization down in Kentucky. Um, and I have some uh, asso a former association with them. Uh, some really, really incredible documentaries about Southern culture, uh, traditional Appalachian culture. And um, so I'm, every month I'm programming those films. Uh, and each month uh, in the lobby, we have like an old um, kind of a traditional band playing before the film. Uh, so that interests people, uh, interests people in um, traditional uh, music. We started up uh, uh, Breakfast in a Movie, and we partnered with um, the Sugar Cafe, which was uh, right down the street. Uh, unfortunately, they've since closed, um, but we, uh, they were a great um, coffee house and bakery, and we're continuing to, uh, uh, the, the owner, former owner of Sugar, um, is continuing to, to do the breakfast with us. You know, they, the one that I came to, I think it was last month, um, that, I mean, the lobby was packed, 125 people, an awesome spread of uh, quiche and muffins and coffee and juice, and um, uh, the place is packed. And then uh, I can't remember, I don't know if it was the Maltese Falcon or, um, uh, I'm forgetting what film, but it was a classic film that showed along with it. And people are just loving it, and I think it's providing something that uh, that people want that they're not getting, um, you know, uh, otherwise a chance to have breakfast, have a great breakfast uh, in a historic theater in downtown Dormont. They get to see their neighbors um, and then get to see a, a kind of a classic movie. Yeah, and then so, you know, a little bit tongue in cheek on the other side of that, uh, created meat in a movie, um, Kane Saloon, which is just down the street on West Liberty. Uh, they're a supporter, an ongoing supporter of um, the Hollywood Theater uh, and sponsor. And um, so we were looking for ways to partner with them uh, and so came up with this idea of meet in a movie. Um, kind of like a, we were, we were thinking kind of post Super Bowl, what are we going to do uh, kind of thing. Um, and so thought of this meet in a movie idea, uh, kind of a guy movie and, uh, and, and serve up some, uh, some you know, big hunks of meat <laughs> along with your movie. And uh, so actually I threw it out on Facebook, what kind of, you know, we're thinking of doing this, what movie would you like to see? People overwhelmingly said The Beastmaster. <laughs> so, um, uh, so that's what we started with. And we had a, a local volunteer who did a great poster for it. Uh, I can show that to you. It's pretty incredible. Uh, and so we had, for a first effort, we had 44 people um, purchase the, the dinner in a movie, and then we had probably th another 30 who came just for the film itself. Um, but yeah, a unique experience. You're not going to get meat in a movie at another um, another theater. Uh, you know, and especially not Beastmaster. Especially not Beastmaster. So uh, we're trying currently for April. I'm trying to get um, the movie Fight Club to do the next meat in a movie uh, with Canes. So I think that would be a popular choice. Uh, we did have a few vegetarians come, and uh, so. Um, they have requested that we provide a vegetarian option for meat in the movie in the future. Um, let's see. Uh, I think, you know, a long-term, uh, a pie-in-the-sky dream of mine, I'm sure, <clears throat> you know, uh, you, you've seen or have been to uh, a theater that serves uh, food and alcohol with a movie. I know I've been to a few, including uh, a theater in Seattle, one in Portland, and one in um, Austin. That uh, it's, it's kind of the idea of a brew in a, in a movie. Um, you know, li liquor laws and licenses are, are tough business in Pennsylvania. Um, so that's why I say it's a, a bit of a pie in the sky idea. But I think it uh, looking for ways to look at a sustainable, unique model of a cinema uh, and arts organization in Pittsburgh that would be something I would love to to pull off if we could if we could get there.